Live from London, it's Plank of the Week with Mike Graham. It's not difficult. Good evening and welcome to Friday night. It's Plank of the Week time. And of course, what a week it has been. Uh, here we are on Talk TV, uh, shining a light on all of those people that you thought at the beginning of the week might be quite intelligent, but look where they ended up by the end of it. Uh, tonight, we've got a fantastic panel for you and one new member who hasn't done it before. Uh, so welcome, first of all, Lester Kraku, who is not new or old either, basically, <laughs> but, uh, but welcome. Well, thanks for having you back. Uh, we've got Peter Blexley, uh, author, TV writer, TV star. I mean, I don't know where it all ends. Uh, for the first time, Time ever, uh, we've got uh, Sam Armstrong with us. Uh, welcome, Sam. Thank you very much for joining us. And Dr. Renee Hundekamp, who's the only doctor in London who's not actually on strike. Uh, so thank God you could make it. This is what we're all fighting for, of course. It is the plank of the week. And it's uh, going to be awarded at the end of the show. So whoever is the biggest plank, I think we might have a pretty good idea who it would be, though. Esther, why don't you kick us off? What's your yes. first nomination? I think this is probably the most well-deserved one. The BBC. Yes, of course. Uh, so the BBC infamously... Uh, suspended Gary Lineker uh, from doing Match of the Day because of his, in, uh, his his incendiary tweet about how the government's policy and language is com with the small migrant uh, the small boats and the migrants is being compared to Nazi Germany. Yeah. Now, I actually don't have a problem with what he said because I don't think he's very bright and I don't mm. get offended when not intelligent people say stupid things. That's yeah. kind of par for the course. I have a problem with the BBC picking a fight that they could not win. Yes. Because one, he is not a BBC employee. He's a freelancer. And two, the BBC is not impartial. And I'm not saying this is slight them. There's no such thing as impartial journalism. Everyone has their biases. And to pretend like they're some sort of beacon of impartiality is what offends me. They know that if they don't keep up this pretense and this farce of being impartial, the license fee is kaput. So they have to say, oh, you know, Gary Lineker, bad you, you shouldn't say that. Well, why weren't they whinging when Gary Lineker was going off during the K Qatar World Cup? Right. Well, all of Qatar's human rights records and all of that. They didn't seem to complain about the lack well, of impartiality Well, this is when, I, when I said, when, when I saw him doing that sort of human rights special on Match of the Day, you know, human rights special of the yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. I didn't know why he was doing it, uh, but the fact that he did do it, I thought, made him cross over from sport into news, though. And I suddenly Absolutely. thought, well, hang on a minute, you can't hide behind the fact that you're a sports presenter if you're now doing a human rights documentary. But I think we should just stop pretending like the BBC is not biased or impartial. You know, back in the day, the BBC was supposed to set the standard for sort of legitimate open broadcasting and journalism and all of that. That standard has now fallen by the wayside. We don't need that anymore. And we certainly don't need to be paying a license fee for it. Well, so I was going to say, do we not need that? But also we need not to pay for it, be forced to pay for it by a stealth tax. Yeah. So I think while we're all paying for it as our state broadcaster, then it does need to have impartiality. But that's impossible because everyone has biases. Look at their COVID reporting. Yes. Would anyone look at the BBC's reporting of COVID and say, oh, actually, they were very impartial? Well, yeah, but impossible. at least they have a duty to try not to be biased. I, I accept your philosophical that's, that's point. Impossible. Well, but it may be is... impossible philosophically, but it's not actually impossible for an organisation like the BBC to do, is it, Peter? There is such a storm in a teacup here because a bloke who used to kick a football <laughs> and now talks about other blokes who kick footballs says something. Well, I'm not remotely interested exactly. in anything he's got to say. Stick to football. And if people want to get their knickers in a twist over a bloke who used to kick football now talks about people who do kick footballs, I think you need that. Exactly. I don't Look understand elsewhere. why people were so incensed by what he said. I wouldn't <clears> go. I wouldn't go to a ceiling fan for medical advice, just like I wouldn't go to a sports pundit for credible political commentary. So I, I, but this I don't. This is the mad world that we now live in, isn't it, Sam? What do you make? Exactly. Of it? Well, look, I, I think I'm right in saying he was last week's plank, yeah. which would make the BBC the biggest plank of all time yes. to lose to last week's plank well, on account <laughs> of acting plankishly. Right, exactly right. Because the bottom line is, is that here's a guy who has single-handedly taken down the BBC. I mean, the BBC well, he... now has been holed below the waterline, I think, by yeah, him. He has, the BBC think... sports people said, oh, we never saw that coming. Well, that tells you everything. Well, and also, I think there's another comparison this week. They've tiptoed around Gary Lineker, mm. one of the, their highest paid person. But at the same time, Fiona Bruce, one of their most yes. senior presenters and journalists, has been thrown under the bus by them this week. No loyalty to her who is employed yeah, by them right. rather than a freelancer. So I think they're being hypocritical. They are. Um, and I think the time has come where we say, hang on a minute, mm. what are you, who are you, and why are we paying for you? Yeah, and I, I think I, an awful lot of what has been, been going on and I take your point Peter but there's been so much I mean you can't disassociate the BBC from politics you just yeah, can't do it of course. you know for, no. for a start they've got a chairman right who's, who's appointed by the Prime Minister uh, who he happened to know very well uh, and who he arranged a loan for who happens to be a Tory so of course the left have been all over him like a rash trying to get rid of him but so this I... is a perfect opportunity to give them a left hook and say back <laughs> off from Richard uh, Sharp and let's see where we go with Gary Lineker but I disassociate 
Gary Lineker from politics, because I'll listen to him talk about football, but, like, I have absolutely no interest in what a former footballer has to say about politics, philosophy, economics, plastering, painting and decorating. <laughs> I'm only really yeah, interested... But for, but for an awful lot of people, though, but for an awful lot yeah. of people, he's the sort of Joan of Arc. Eight million of, the of Remainers. Them. But I mean, the thing he is, that he's the Joan of Arc because they agree with him. If, if yeah. Gary Lineker's tweet was, you know what, Suella Braverman is doing a great job and I completely agree with the government's policy yeah. on the small boats, he would have been rinsed. He, he would have been, been, he would he been crucified. Job, exactly. And I, that's why I said the standard shouldn't matter. The standard shouldn't be, because I agree with you, it's OK to say it. I, the standard should be, you're an idiot. Yeah. Whether I agree with you or not, I don't care what you have to say. Yeah. You're not there for your for your astute political views. You're there because you're talking about people kicking around a football, as you said. But the bigger issue is the BBC constantly trying to put on this farce that they're impartial because they're so scared of losing the licence yeah. fee, which they will eventually. They will lose it. So I, I suggest just transition. just to make matters worse, right? Just when you thought it couldn't get worse for the BBC, the Sun this morning, or this week, rather, uh, have a front page in which it says the BBC are hounding Claudia Lawrence for a payment of a mm. TV licence fee 14 years after her disappearance and where the police fear she may have been murdered. So they're actually sending fines to this woman's house. Her mother, who's 79, is going round to the house, picking up these fines, becoming enraged, upset. Her, her daughter's still missing after 14 years. She doesn't know what to do. She's asked the BBC to stop sending them. They haven't. She's asked the police to intervene. They haven't done anything. I think it will probably stop now. But, I mean, how ludicrous I mean, I would, can you get? I would... And 52,000 people were fined last year by the BBC. Yeah. I would, I would, this uh, is one, in, one in ten prosecutions in this country. One in ten yeah. of every criminal prosecution is for BBC non-payment of licence fees. Unbelievable. They are huge bullies. Mm. I don't watch TV, so I don't pay the licence fee. Quite right. Every week, every week, I get a letter through from the BBC yeah. saying, give us your money yeah. or we'll send someone to kick down your door. Yeah. And also, like you say that you don't have to pay for a licence, but even if you watch this show yeah. on an iPad on live television... You know, you will, I'm afraid, be subject to paying yeah. a licence fee. It's a ridiculous system. I, I think we should do something creative with the letters because I've received them and they're usually very colourful and they're red, like, you will be prosecuted. And I was thinking of making a piñata out of them. Um, just, <laughs> you know, covering a piñata, filling it with some chocolate eggs and just being like, this is the BBC licence yeah. fee and this is what I think of it. Yeah. Well, let's have a look at Tim Davey, who is the Director General, who actually is supposed to be in charge of this um, <clears throat> show, I would call it. Um, let's have a look. Tim Davey, are you going to resign? Impartiality is a big value for the BBC, but so is trust. Right now, there are many people in the UK that simply do not trust you. Do you think you should resign? Absolutely not. I think my job is to serve licence fee payers and deliver a BBC that is really focused on world-class, impartial, landmark output. And I look forward to us resolving this situation and looking forward to delivering that. Yeah, I'm not sure we'd describe a match of the day without any commentators at all. Well, they increased the viewership, didn't they? Apparently it was better. Yeah, well, they, 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 the viewership went odd. up. Yeah. I tell you, Mr Davey, yeah. right, he's a man of a certain age. Yeah. I saw footage of him walking into a broadcasting house the other day yeah. with kind of like a jacket and a shirt, no tie, obviously, too hip for a tie, of <laughs> and white trainers. Oh. Do me a favour, mate. No That's your age. That's no good. <laughs> um, actually, Cheltenham's allowed trainers this, this year for the first time. But anyway, uh, Peter, you're next with the parole board, not for the first time. Do you want to be in my gang? My gang? Yeah, no. <laughs> good. Because I haven't God. got one. No, good. But, but a certain singer... I don't singer, want to be in his gang either. No. A certain singer, or should I say paedophile, yes. Repeat sex offender, yes. The repugnant and repulsive Gary Glitter yeah. got himself in front of the parole, bowl, parole board and they, in their infinite wisdom, brackets not, close brackets, decided to release him. And, of Brilliant. course, what happened? Within a matter of days, Glitter got his grubby hands on a smartphone yeah. and was overheard asking how you access the dark web. Yes. Well, fair play to everybody who played any single part in that disclosure mm. of him getting the phone. Well, it was a son journalist, I think, who broke the story, wasn't it? Yep. And... Of course, he has now been recalled to prison yeah. where he belongs. But the parole board are just ludicrous for ever thinking this repeat offender who has a paedophile streak as, as, as wide as any ocean mm. and he's clearly never going to be rehabilitated. He's also never admitted being in the wrong, has he? No. He is no. not somebody who has shown any sign of, of uh, you know, remorse no. about his victims. He was sentenced to 16 years. He's allowed out in a... Alongside... I think one in three 
of, of, of all people who are um, done for parole. Oh, sorry, no, it's the third. Yeah, it's the third um, of people who are, go, who are released have to go back in. Yeah. Because well, they've I mean, I don't breached under- their parole. What I don't understand is I think everybody sitting here now would have predicted that this would have happened. So why can we see it, but the parole board, mm. whose very job it is to see it, can't see it? I suspect it's because... Our prisons are overcrowded and we don't have enough prisons. Yeah. And they're, they're trying to build more, particularly Cat A and Cat B prisons. Um, but it's taking a while and because go- the governments have, you know, successive governments have kicked the can down the road. Now we're in a situation where the idea of releasing someone like this monster is actually possible because there, there's just not enough space for people like this. And that's, that's the real issue. It's like, why, why would you possibly think someone like this who is, again, the most repeat offending paedophile you could ever find is because, well, there's, a infrastru- there's an infrastructure issue with our prison system, and that's what the, it boils the, down the to. The thing I find most disgusting is, are the lies. The parole board comes out and says he's going to be subject to very strict conditions mm. to keep the public safe. What do they do? They send him into a bail hostel in the middle of a housing estate just around the corner from a, a kid's playground. Right. Every parent's nightmare. They then lie to the parents, try and suppress the information. Then they say, we're keeping a close watch yeah. on him. And then it takes the Sun and then newspaper... Then it takes the Sun newspaper to expose yeah. the fact. He's looking, we imagine, for the dark web in order to, to, to look for the same... Well, who knows what he was doing, but it wasn't going to be good. Place. Some Absolutely. nefarious purpose. Now, the parole board, actually, have had their own series mm. on the BBC right. of late, Right. So you can go on at the iPlayer and find it. There was four episodes, and you see them actually doing their work and making their decisions. What I'm really interested to see is if perhaps in a year or two's time, the BBC will revisit those very hearings Mm -hmm. and so we get some kind of outcome on what happened to those... So all those people got released. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. that would be a good idea. Uh, Uh, The best idea I heard was on your show this week, Mm. Mike, that if they breach their bow... They go back into prison and right. start their sentence, start all, the over sentence all over again. Oh, so he that's should be fantastic. now in for 16 years. A great oh. idea. Um, who's your first nominee? So, my first nominee is Wales. Good. Yeah. The As whole an country? country? The whole country. Yeah. Okay. As yeah. you. Because. <laughs> there, I'm, I'm up with that. There's a piece of government <laughs> advice this week in Wales is that they may need to get rid of statues or paintings or even buildings or something. Buildings? Ha- yeah, e- even they've even Blimey. included buildings in this of historic white middle aged. Men, right. able-bodied. Sorry, although I think Nelson. Because there's hardly was any of them in Wales. Right, able-bodied men, <laughs> because <laughs> they need to rewrite the contextual history narrative. Yeah. And people might be offended at Nelson or you know any of these people. And I'm just thinking about that. You know, when did we move to this governed by people's mm. feelings? Yeah. People might get hurty feelings yeah. if they have but to look also, at a statue. These are people who nobody's actually spoken to. These are people that don't exist. These are people <laughs> that are in the heads of people like Mark Drakeford. You think, oh, there are people that will be offended. Which people? Are and you offended? know the crazy thing is it's an arrogance because we're judging them by our standards today. Because everyone exactly. all of these people have the arrogance to think that back then they would have been the ML, the Martin Luther King or the Rosa Parks or the revolutionary that would have gone against the system at, at the time. Uh, um, that these these atrocities happened. Um, and it's just, it's so arrogant to assume that about yourself, but that's what gives them the moral high ground to do this. And also, it's Wales. I'm sorry, <laughs> white men are not exactly a rarity in Wales. They're really not. It's just, it's just so mind-boggling. Well, I did a bit of, you know, research into what kind of statues they, they might be demolishing soon. And I, I was drawn to a statue of the Pope, mm. Pope John Paul II, mm-hmm. in a cathedral there. And I thought, well, he is a white, middle-aged man yeah. when they made that. Are they going to start ransacking churches and destroying statues of the Pope? Or well, they, they Jesus, definitely will do maybe. that, but they won't do that in mosques. And you, I think we well, both know why. exactly. And I just think we are actually living in 1984 now. Yeah. They're rewriting history. Yeah. They're, they're burning books almost. They're editing books for children. We are in 1984. But is it not offensive? Because and nobody's it, asking for it, by the way. No, yeah, no, nobody's, I don't this, know this anyone who's asking for it. But that's what I find so offensive, because of all the things that people are going through with the cost of living crisis and unemployment and all of these things, it's offensive that the elected officials are focusing on this... And spending on te- money on... Ten, and tearing down statues because someone happens to be white. Yeah. They're actually doing their job. Are people getting paid? Is it their job to come up with hair brain oh, yeah. schemes oh, like this? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So what we're gonna do today, or we're gonna sit around and we're gonna we're gonna do a review 
of all our statues. Mm. Not unlike... There's, an entire, there's an entire commission in London who have been commissioned by the Mayor of London to look at the statues and the names of the streets to see if they need to be changed. But you know the thing is, this is a uniquely Western phenomenon because yeah. in other parts of the world, they're not concerning themselves about this. They're not concerning themselves... Like, the Mughal... The people in India are not, you know, weeping about the what the Mughal Empire did and, and, and slaughtering thousands of people. People in Africa are not complaining about what, what dictators did there or tearing down their statues. It's a uniquely Western phenomenon. It's only in the West that we are, we are encouraged this guilt, this eternal guilt about history, which is actually very nuanced. Yeah. And I can't believe no one else is speaking against this. Mark Drakeford, by the way, is the guy who roped off sections of Tesco's during yes. the COVID. Oh, yes. Because it might be unnecessary if you, you don't could need, go you down don't need to the that aisle exactly. and buy things. Didn't need sanitary towels, apparently. No. They were not yeah. essential. Exactly. I mean, ironically, there aren't all that many, I, I'm going to get cancelled for saying this, Welsh uh, historic figures. But one of the ones they will have to revisit is, of course, the Black Prince. Yes. So the Black Prince is going to be cancelled for being mm. too white. Yes. Uh, How ironic. How ironic. <laughs> yeah. what, what I don't know is... What about know, the dragon? Tom Jones this, the these dra days. What colour's the dragon? Tom it's Jones amazing. slathers on that fake tan yeah. so so thick. Does he? Where does he count? Is he Ooh, too white yeah. anymore? I, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to lie. I still I didn't believe he was Welsh when I moved here. I was like, oh, no, 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 not Tom Jones. I was like, well, I was like, he looks like my uncle. Things are and not then I was actually told that he's Welsh. Yeah. Um, yeah. By, by good there. I mean, they banned Delilah after all, didn't they? And well, ever yeah. since they've done that, I don't think Wales, Wales, Wales I mean, team have done anything what at all. Is going they, on? they beat Italy, and that's it. Yeah. They've lost to everybody else. I mean, it's just crazy. It's it is. absolute craziness. So, Wales, I'm afraid, you're a plank. The whole country. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> the whole country. I, I think that's great. Uh, Sam, who's your first number? Well, my plank is Keir Starmer, yeah. Sir Keir. Excellent. Because Sir Keir of. A late regular feature. Has been trying to make himself out to be Mr. Moderate, Mr. Safe. Yeah. But ever well, so Mr. Interesting, even. Uh, the mask slips, and one of them was this week when it was revealed in the papers that the court case that means that asylum seekers that are filling the hotels around this country get given credit cards mm. every week that they can spend money on. Uh, who was it that won that court case that all the migrants, which they're flooding in the country to get these credit cards, it was a young Mr Keir Starmer, no, KC. Of course it was. And, of course, this year, he didn't only win it, he also won it that the payments have to go up mm. by the rate of oh, inflation right, yeah, they've got an inflation year. pay rise. So they are going to get... Asylum seekers in this country are going to get amazing. a bigger pay rise than nurses. Is it 26% they're getting, just like yeah. the junior doctors yeah. are asking for? He's also a plank this week for... Uh, when In Prime Minister's questions, when he had an opportunity to ask about any number of things mm. uh, that are going on in the world, he spent... And I know you're going to hate this, Peter, six questions on Gary Lineker and the BBC. It was all he was asking yeah. about. It's absolutely incredible. The, the interesting thing about Keir Starmer is he's actually almost equally despised by the left in this country, which is an interesting phenomenon. The Corbynites hate him. I, I know. I mean, the, the Corbynites were going to hate him regardless of what he did. But, you know, for all of our grievances around sort of like uh, Rishi Sunak and the Conservative Party being unconservative, which is very true, there's also this deep apathy with someone like Keir Starmer because even the hardcore Labour voters don't really see much of a difference between him and mm. the sort of the Tories. But also, he's just a deeply not traditional Labour figure. He's deeply unpopular. He's a North London solicitor that's worked in air-conditioned offices his entire life. He's, he's, you know, let's not even talk about Jimmy Savile. But he really doesn't echo the kind of concerns of people that would naturally vote for mm. him. So we're really at an impasse here. But that's partly because he's not actually telling people anything about himself, which is yeah. why he spends Prime Minister question time asking six questions, yeah. trying to make the Tories look like they've influenced the BBC, right. instead of getting to grips with policy yeah. and telling people what they would do, mm. you know, well, asking questions that would show up the government and saying, well, this is what we would do. Yeah. But that's because he's terrified. He doesn't want a Miliband bacon sandwich moment, and we all remember those <laughs> pictures. He's still know. doing them, by the yeah. way. He's on his tour of Britain with the wind farms and all that. Have you seen some of that stuff yeah. he's been doing? But Unbelievable. He doesn't want a Michael Foot donkey jacket sort of thing. Yeah. He doesn't want a Gordon Brown in the back of the car with the mic still going, yeah. that dreadful woman type yeah. thing. So the more he stays... Also, you've forgotten a... to mention the Corbyn slamming of the car door, which is always good. Yeah, You know, when indeed. he saw the photographers outside his house, he always slammed the car door really hard. Yeah, he doesn't want any of those kind <laughs> of moments because he thinks they will be hugely damaging. Mm. Yeah. And, of course, the more he says nothing and doesn't really plant his flag in the ground the more it is perceived that he lurches to the centre. Yeah. The centre he's got a great talent, though, it's, for saying it's, it's nothing. He's done, rope, he's done all these speeches lately, mm. but I can't remember anything that he said. But you know what he's doing? He's doing... He is, he's playing a sort of a, almost a Biden strategy, which is they will wheel him out 
They'll open the freezer and wheel him out when he's needed and <laughs> connect all the wires and yeah. then, you know, charge him up <laughs> and he'll say what he needs to say. And that's not incendiary and that's yeah. been, been really combed through by the sensitivity readers. And then, you know, wheel him back and then shut the freezer door. Instead of an electric car, an electric Kia. Exactly. But, uh, with Very the, good. <laughs> See exactly. Did there. But the thing, the problem you're having it's there like Max is... Max Headroom, isn't it? If, <laughs> but this is the thing. If you leave it too late and at the end of the day, People look back and say, you know what, these have been turbulent few years, but I still trust the Tories before, more than Keir Starmer because at the end of the day, things look marginally better than they were last year. If somehow Rishi Sunak can keep it together, that's really going to work I mean, against him. It'd, it'd be an incredible thing if the yeah, Tories exactly. actually managed to win the election because I mean, I mean this I, is the one it, they should it's not, not win. But this is the thing, because it's Keir Starmer, because he has the personality of plywood, yeah. it's not outside the, the realm of possibility. And I yeah, think he not. needs to bear that in mind. No, I think he absolutely does. Well, coming up, uh, we're going to be talking about a member of the royal family just for a change. And we'll go up to Scott as well. Plank of the week. <laughs> Welcome back to Plank of the Week, and it's my turn, so we better get straight to it. Uh, I'm going to go north of the border. Uh, we've done Wales already. I'm going to go up to Scotland, where they're currently having uh, the series of hustings for the next leader uh, of the SNP, Scottish National Party, uh, or Scottish Nationalist Party, as Boris Johnson used to delight in calling mm -hmm. them. Um, and we've got three candidates. We've got Kate Forbes, mm -hmm. who's from the Wee Freeze of the, uh, the sort of slightly evangelical Christian organisation up in Scotland. Uh, we've got Ash Reen. I don't know anything about her, so I can't <laughs> tell you what she does. Um, and then we've got Humza Youssef. Uh, who's been in the government and is the kind of shoo-in candidate, supposedly, mm. for Nicola Sturgeon, who stepped down the other day. Uh, he's most famous, of course, for falling off that scooter mm. when he was in Parliament. Uh, which is that a funny video, yeah, yeah, which is a video I run all the time, but the, to the, today I think we'll let him off. Um, but he's a plank this week for a couple of reasons. He's come out and said two things. One, that Scotland will be independent in five years. Now, I'm pretty sure the SNP have been saying this since about 2010. Um, and certainly since 2014, mm. the SNP under Nicola Sturgeon, who have been in complete control of the country with a partly a small kind of smidgen of green um, kind of, you know, coalition, have basically not moved the dial at all. You know, when you do a poll in Scotland and ask how many people want independence for Scotland, it's exactly the same as it was in 2014, which means that nothing has changed, which means that there's nobody there any longer who wants more independence. They haven't added to the pot. He then said... Uh, that in another five years, after they've been in power for five years, I, they're thinking they'd do away with the, the king. They don't think they want uh, King Charles. They don't think they want a monarchy. You know, these people are completely and utterly deluded because most people in Scotland, one, would like to remain part of the United Kingdom and two, would very much like to have a sovereign. Mm. And I don't think there's anyone, even if they did become independent, who would say, well, let's just get rid of them. You know, yeah. like one of these Commonwealth countries would occasionally suggest, you know. So he's opened up this whole ridiculous debate and they're basically doing this runaround kind of uh, leadership election as fast as they possibly can because they're hoping, uh, I'm told, to get him in before anything bad happens because we know that there's a couple of investigations currently going on into Nicola Sturgeon and what went on with and the, her and the party and Peter the party's Murrell finances and yeah. the party's finances and all of that and I'm led to believe that that could blow up at any minute so they want to get this guy in before any of that happens because otherwise he's got no chance so I'm so they're only having time, the battle of Balmoral yes right because that'll have to be fought well, over won't they'll it? have to put Hadrian's wall back up I know yeah. haggis and fried Mars bars uh, yeah. that should be something but can you imagine how long it'll behold. take them to actually build Hadrian's wall now Oh, forget I about mean, it. I yeah, mean, yeah, forget it. But, well, it's, the it's, thing is... I mean, HS2 exactly. will still be being built at that point, you know, <laughs> The thing is, has no now. one questioned what an independent <laughs> Scotland would look like? So no. there, there, there was a piece today saying no one wants a president, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, which I think is the stuff of nightmares and is very Well, true. that's what he would like, though. But, <laughs> but, but, the, but the question is, what does an independent Scotland look like? Does Cora. an independent Scotland look like, a, a, you know, a vassal EU state? Does well, it have its own currency? Admit... Well, well, exactly. They don't call you know, what does a Republic of Scotland look like? Who, who is, who would be the head of state? I mean, it's, it's all, it's very weird. I mean, has no one asked these questions because they just keep harping on about the same talking points, and I just, I find it completely shocking that we've never seen an in-depth analysis or at least a, a, a detailed. Well, the SNP will say plan. that they've done several, but of course they're all based on a lot of old cobblers, aren't they? Yeah. I, I think this is the big SNP problem that fundamentally they don't know what they want more. No. Do they want to be an independent state or do they want to be a Davos-going, global, progressive nation? And this is what did it in for Nicola, was yeah. that she didn't know which one of those you preferred. She should have known that if you let a man who you can see through the leggings, 
clearly has a penis mm. into a woman's jail, that your career is going to be yeah. in trouble. I mean, that pretty much summed up all SNP policy, didn't it? Yeah. It did, and time. actually, I think what this has now done is we've got Kate Forbes, let's forget the other one, Kate yeah. Forbes, and we've got your man, yeah. Hamza Youssef. And I think, for the first time ever in Kate Forbes, we've seen an honest politician yeah. Yeah. because she's religious and I'm not but I'm quite impressed by her saying look I'm religious I didn't vote for gay marriage right. but I still would not disrespect anybody in that whereas your well, man has you kind keep of saying said my man I have to say at this point I have not done <laughs> voting for this guy um I think he might be quite funny if he gets in but no you're right he ducked out of a vote he did and, and then he's been a bit fudgy that there's on something it. come oh something's come up I can't possibly mm -hmm. vote on that even because... though he's very aware that the Muslim community would never be in favor well, of gay marriage well that was precisely marriage. why he didn't vote but this is but this is the thing though because he's trying to straddle two worlds but at the, at the point where you do become leader of Scotland mm. effectively you do have to make some, some sort of you know statements or at least judgments on these things yeah. and to, he this is what politicians do they think they can avoid issues and skirt around them and vanish and play Houdini until the time comes where they have to say something, and they just look at opinion polls and see which is going to yeah. get them in the least amount of trouble. And this is what Starmer's that's been pathetic, doing. pathetic, though. Starmer's been doing all of that. And it's going to backfire, because at will. some point, people's opinions change, and they're going to look back and say, well, you avoided it for this long, so you either have this opinion, or you're going to have to change your mind, both of which are not good looks. Well, I, I love think... principled politicians. Yeah. Yes. You know, those that not many of them. stand for something. Yeah. Whatever part of the political spectrum mm, they're I on. I agree. You know, from Thatcher to Tony Benn, both very principled people, mm. and I respected them both because they knew what they believed in and they were not going to be shaken. See, I think Sam's hit the nail on the head, and I actually think that feeling about this whole trans debate in Scotland is rumbling below the surface. Mm. Lots of people feel they can't talk about it. And what's going to happen is, when they actually vote, despite what they might say, and I know they're neck and neck in the polls, they're going to put their cross next to Forbes, and I predict yeah. here on this show that she's going to win. There you go. Well, I'd like to see that, actually. Yeah, that actually you the better news we've heard all day. suggesting that Hamza Yusuf is my man. Absolutely <laughs> disgraceful. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Esther, who's your next one? My next one is our lovely Chancellor. God Yay, almighty. Bless him. He Jeremy was front Hunt. and centre this week, wasn't uh, he? I know. I mean, he made a terrible joke that you pointed out about... I'm very uh, unhappy about this. Uh, ...Hancock's, you know, WhatsApp messages being leaked, which, again, I'm just going to, you know, leave that to a dad joke, a very poor... A dad joke in very poor taste, but it's the budget. And it has nothing that particularly inspired anyone. The corporation tax so is still going up. But what I have a particular problem with is just this disingenuous way of trying to write it off, saying, oh, only the top 10% of companies mm. are going to be paying the increased rate of 25%. He actually sold it as a 9% drop. Ex but here's the thing. Who do you think generates the most revenue in corporation tax anyway? It's those top 10%. And the UK is obviously, is right now, still woefully uncompetitive in comparison to other developed countries. So I don't know why he's trying to write that off. And that's one thing that really offends Although me. Although I don't know if that's true. I mean, I don't know enough about the, the, the take, as it were, on, on corporation tax. But I would bet you that smaller businesses actually provide by far and away more money than the big sort of top 10 companies. The top 10 because there's a lot of small businesses in this country who have been absolutely ripped apart by the mm. tax regime. And many of them are paying an awful lot more tax yeah. now. So I would I would imagine altogether well, the they pay is, more. Because the thing, for, for smaller businesses, a, a more significant part of their um, sort of the taxes they pay come from actually their wages and the yeah. wage bill, so NI and all of that. And that actually takes a more significant share. And the thing is, smaller businesses can't hide in the sense that they can't, you know, allocate certain money to, to uh, investment or yeah. all these kind of dividends and all of that. The, you know, the tricky way, the sly ways these large companies get away with it. But it's, at some point, there's still a threshold. And at some point, these top, the top 10% of companies still do pay the most mm. significant yeah. share of corporations. And of course, they're the ones that can choose to move, of course. Exactly. And some of them are moving to Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, for lower tax rates. Uh, I mean, if you're prepared to put up with the, the nightlife uh, in, in Ireland and all the limited <laughs> skill sets and all the rest of it, in my view, uh, then there's something must be badly wrong with the tax system. Well, there must be. Also, the only other people that you seem to help were people with children. And um, pensioners. And I thought to myself, you know, I've, I've got kids, but they've grown up more or less now, but that's not the point. But I think there's an awful lot of people that don't have children in mm -hmm. this country, and there's an awful lot of people that don't actually need to have their childcare paid for. And there's been this kind of whining that's been going on ever since he announced the children's... But it's, uh, it's also... Uh, but but free, where the free, are these children? Also the free childcare stuff. Yeah. You know... Why are we giving people free childcare? But it's not even just that. But the childcare places aren't there. Yeah. No. Well, right? there's, there's that. We've broadened it out. Mm. There's, you, you can go the length and breadth of the country and see nurseries that have closed. Yeah. Because yeah. they couldn't. Yeah, but make why ends would meet. why should ordinary taxpayers be subsidising other people's children no, so that other is, people can get richer can, on our money? I, I can even it. understand that because the UK has a very low birth rate. But the argument here is it's a deeply unconservative. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> <Or> mine. <laughs> mine. Or hers. <laughs> 
It's deeply unconservative <laughs> to say that instead of actually subsidizing mothers to stay at home with their children, because we know that a primary give, uh, caregiver up until the point that the child is three or four is actually best for the child, you're saying that we're going to cover 30 hours of, of, of free childcare for one to two year olds, when you could actually just give that, yeah. that, that but in money a year's to the mother. Time as well. Exactly. But you could give that money to the mother. So, one, it's deeply unconservative. But also, there's so many aspects of this, this, this budget, like, you know, uh, raising the limit of, of how much you can contribute to your pension fund before you start paying tax. Well, duh. Yeah. Why should you have to pay tax on, your, on a pension well, past a certain limit? That's, you're <laughs> taking care of yourself. Yeah. This, this government and this country, for the longest time, has just been confused. And this confusion has led to this anemic growth rate, this discombobulated uh, workforce, this you know, uninspiring vision for this country that's actually just, you know, flushing it down the toilet yeah. in my eyes. I think it I comes think, back I to think the shame. Chancellor. Yeah, <laughs> I, think it, I think it comes back to the shame that if you've done well for yourself and you're paying a lot of tax, yeah. then you should be ashamed. Yeah, exactly. Not, exactly. not And eventually, no, some people exactly. are just going to have had enough. We've, and we've, going to leave. I've had enough of this as well. We have to move on, otherwise <laughs> I'm in trouble. Peter Plexley, what's your next one? <laughs> are you all right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Need a hug. He's upset. <laughs> Somebody's upset him. Prince Andrew's distraught. Oh, God. <laughs> and if the prince despair. is distraught, I'm distraught, am yeah. I, Egg? Right? Yeah. Talk about a plank. He's been having a whinge. Yeah. Right? There so, he is when he was allowed out. Oh. So, so, <laughs> sources I've seen say... I've him laughing for ages. <laughs> yeah, sources reportedly say he's distraught because apparently his mum, the late Queen, left 650 million quid <laughs> and she's left it all to Charles, apparently. That, that is a bit wounding, though, isn't it? And, and he hasn't, if you, if you're he hasn't got a carrot out of it. I, I mean, Edward hasn't got any either, presumably. No, but apparently she Anne. has to do that. So under their, their rules not to pay tax, inheritance tax that the rest of us have to pay, um, but they leave it all to the next, the next monarch. King. Next of king. Next of king. There you go. And then they don't pay inheritance tax. Yeah. So that's, let's not get into that debate right now. But so now Charles should then... Send it out to his siblings, right. but apparently not. he's not doing. Well, you wouldn't that. give it to Andrew, would you? Don't <laughs> no, you know would, I mean, right. he would be at the uh, bottom. Yeah, I mean, of the to list. be honest, you might be better off not having it because now there's nothing for the so-called further victims to come <laughs> along and uh, make some more yeah. claims again. Yeah, he doesn't want to take out no, no, hundred no. million. No, no, no. Keep it all, all in the trust. It. Look, I, I, I've, I've said I don't agree with Andrew being given Frogmore Cottage because I don't see why this 63-year-old man needs a five-bedroom house in Windsor. No. However, I even if he's going to put his ex-wife in it, he could resurrect Jeffrey Epstein, and there'd still be room in that house. That yeah. is completely unnecessary. You know, Frogmore Cottage has 10 bedrooms. Oh, good Lord. It's I just want to... It's not really a cottage at all, is it? It has 10 bedrooms. Have you been it's, there? It's a mini mansion. <laughs> but look, this is just... You know, this really is kind of like... The, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? Why are you complaining about this? It's not exactly like you're living in a one-bedroom flat somewhere in the middle of the country. You're you're living in. And he luxury. has no income, right? Exactly. He, he lives high on the hole. He's never had a job in Every his life. Every time you see him, he's driving a rather nice Range Rover. Where's he get that money from? I'd exactly. give him a free bed semi. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I wouldn't see him entirely Slough. impoverished. That's not far from. I don't, I don't mind. Just eh? just a three bed Slough. semi, Slough. a family <laughs> saloon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and then go off your truck, like a Ford get a job. Focus or I think he needs a, need a family job. saloon. He's the same age as me. He doesn't need a family grassing. saloon. He doesn't need a family saloon. Yeah, he, he, doesn't, he certainly doesn't need a three-bed semi. He needs a one-bedroom flat in Stevenage. Well, Stevenage yeah, that's, that's right. even our I don't think they not. deserve it, though. Oh, yeah, they should I have this one-bedroom flat in Hackney? I don't think he'd be The thing is, he has no insight, does he? He has no insight. He can't read the room. He has no judgment. He has no judgment, and he's very arrogant, and he actually has a very inflated view of his own intelligence. And he's got nothing to do. Yeah, he's so hard up. To do. He's so hard up now. We might have to go eat at Pizza Express. Yeah. <laughs> Rumor has it, if you have the misfortune to go and see him, right? He kind of has you as a captive audience, and will spend hours and hours and hours explaining every nook and cranny of where so ever he's living, mm. because that actually gives him something to do. I saw a story the other day mm. where he's apparently thinking of giving another interview. Oh <laughs> dear God. Yeah, yeah. In America. Yeah. Right? Yeah, no, no, he that'll clear it all up. That. Yeah, yeah, that'll, that'll clear fine. everything up. That's what you should do. Go and give an yeah. interview uh, to somebody on CNN. Or maybe you should um, just vanish. You know, what people that used to be disgraced in the past, they just vanished. They went to do charity work in Somalia. Yeah. And yeah. They got you know, nicked by the Taliban. The you know, they actually just, China or they did, they did yeah. something good, right? Just vanish. Yeah. How yeah. about that? Go do good works. Yeah. Gracefully, A bit like Harry and Meghan, you mean? Oh, yeah, of course. That, that great kind of work vanishing. with, with, with yeah. charity Netflix. Yeah, uh -huh. absolutely right. Uh, coming up, uh, The Good Doctor is going to be giving us her second nomination, and we might be going to Hollywood as well. Um, this is Talk TV. This is Blank of the Week.
Welcome back to Plank of the Week. It is a Friday night. We're halfway through, uh, but we've still got plenty of nominations to go. And I'm going to go uh, to Dr Renee for the next one. Who's that? So I'm jumping over the pond to Joe Biden. Oh, why not? He hasn't okay. been on for a while. And I've never Another nominated... regular. Yeah. yeah, but I've never nominated him. And I, he did an interview, which he rarely does, a TV interview on Monday night, where he said that, as his mother would say, which I don't believe, and you'll realise why mm. in a second, um, anybody denying medical treatment to trans children under 18 mm. is as close to sinful as you can get. Sinful? Sinful. Blimey. Because these children don't wake up one day and say, oh, I think I'll be a man today. But you know what? They do. Because mm. children do all sorts of things. Because they're children. Yeah. And it was summed up for me this week by a detransitioner who went from girl to boy, had some really radical surgery, and now she's gone back to being a girl, but obviously she doesn't have her bits anymore. Mm. And she That's said... That's shocking when that happens. It's really shocking. And she said, I decided that I didn't want to be a woman when I didn't know what it was to be a woman, and adults let me do it. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, Joe, the most sinful people in all of this are the adults letting this happen. Yes, and so in some good cases, for encouraging it to happen. Yes. You know? And actually leading people down the road to the to the doorway yes. at the end of the Absolutely. road. Absolutely. Why do you go through there? And yeah. this is in response to Ron DeSantis, who mm. is yet another Republican senator, who has decided to pass laws where children will not be able to access medication or surgery before the age of 18. Mm. And I would argue that surgery should be delayed to 25. Well, that seems at least sensible, doesn't it? Mm. To, I mean, to, you can't, you can't even get your tubes tied until problem. you're at least 20. I'm sorry, do you, do you know the, the medical guidance around getting your tubes tied as a woman? I don't think that... I think they, doctors really don't want to do it on someone who's under 30 no. or 25. Mm. I mean, it, it, just as a woman, you know you're a woman with all your bits and you, you, you've decided I don't want to have children. Look at how much grief they give them to try and get their tubes tied. Rightly so, because it's a very permanent decision. Why don't we do the same thing with transitioning surgery? Yeah. Yes, yeah. why don't we? But and I mean, even if they make it 18... 18, you know, yeah. Yeah, you know, you still can't have a drink out there. No. You know, yeah, you, exactly. could, you could have yourself mutilated, but you can't yeah. go and have a drink. It's yeah. absolutely bizarre. Celebrate. Yeah. And I'm yeah. really not sure why Joe is so wedded to this, and he really is. He had well, a... he, do you know what's happened to Joe Biden? Is he has been captured, basically, yeah. by the crazed left of the Democratic Party. And a lot of people that I talk to in America, because I used to live over there, um, are very disturbed about the fact that he has taken this massive jump to the left. The other thing that people are really annoyed about is this idea that he thinks that... Uh, the students should be forgiven all of their student loans. Oh, yes. Because it's incredibly un-American. Yeah, and because it's going to get the Americans back are saying, a bit like they said with Obamacare, they go, well, why should we pay for these kids from other people's families to go to university? If you want to go to university, you pay in America. Exactly. Yeah. If you want to make more money, you make more money. They have no sort of socialist state, but he's turning into a kind of socialist government, isn't he? He but is, it, and last yeah. week he had a trans woman mm. go to the White House and meet his wife to get an award on International Women's Day. And I'm sorry, I won't stop carping on about this. Yeah. This is erasing gay people, it's erasing women, and it needs to stop. And when we've got the leader of the free world saying it's sinful yeah. not to let these children... First of all, his mother didn't say that, because his, his mother, mother didn't know what a trans person... No, exactly. And Joe Biden doesn't know what it is as well. He's been wheeled out <laughs> of his fridge. He's been wound up, programmed, had all the wires fitted Injected in. Injected with Cut, the uh, exactly with a big Botox. Drug. Fit, cut, you know, wheeled out to make this speech, and he doesn't understand any of this trans stuff. He doesn't get it. He's not interested. He doesn't care. He is just a mouthpiece for someone with a far more radical agenda. Now, the issue here is this actually has far more wide-reaching consequences, like the student debt thing. There is no such thing as forgiving student debt. It's going to be reabsorbed back, in, back into the system, and people who've never been to university are going to have to pay. In the same way, allowing people to mutilate themselves is going to cause a mental health crisis across the country. And we know what happens with mental health issues. How many shooters do we know that have mental health issues and we're closing up public asylums across states because there are no you know, federal legislation around state-funded state, state -funded asylums? So there are actually many knock-on effects from his stupidity. It's not him. No. He's, he's, a, he's a corpse. Many knock-on effects. And it, it goes to fertility in the future, exactly. how we replenish mm. our society when people are having their fertility ruined by right. these drugs. There's many knock-on effects. It is mad, effects. isn't it? Do you think um, Biden knew what he was doing this week when he met up with Rishi Sunak and that bloke Albanese from Australia? Do you think he had any idea well, of the submarines they, they were talking about? I mean, I'm not I think a doctor, something else. They, they did look like they'd given him extra meds that morning. <laughs> you know, slipped a bit of caffeine into yeah. the cornflakes. Well, this is it. He does look like somebody who's been kind of primed to be appearing on front of a camera for sort of, you know, sort of half an hour and then... He, sort of he, he keeps off. combing that comb over. And yeah. less there he's, he's, like, he's, like, um, he's like someone from the Adams family. Uh. You know, he's just been defrosted and just dragged but out. But he he's may not run alive. again. He may run again, which should be... He, no, he is running again. This is the thing. He's going to run again. Well, that's fantastic. Well, 
here's the thing. The Republicans <laughs> have a way of messing everything up. So I wouldn't put it past them to have the corpus president back in power again. Which I mean, if you had DeSantis, Biden, I mean, come on. Yeah, no, I've spoken to Demo Democrats who say if it was Biden versus DeSantis, they'd vote for DeSantis. Yeah, no, but the, the thing is, are. there's a big narcissist in the middle called Trump, so let's see how that's... Yeah. The thing well, is, I just find it, keep it all going. I find it really bizarre that any human being on this planet in their 80s even understands what this trans business is. I know. Is. They don't. Why do they, they, they even people? care? Exactly. Anyway, well, Sam, <laughs> Sam, it's time for your uh, next nominee. Well, I'm going for Hugh Grant. Right. <laughs> Hugh Grant is a man that, with his sort of flopsy-dopsy hair, likes to pretend or act like he's a nice guy. Mm. Every film, Notting Hill, Four Weddings and a Funeral, yeah. even Love Actually, where he's a bit of a creep, to be honest, but people seem to think he's a nice guy, he's seeming like he's nice. But this week he was at the Oscars when he was asked to do an interview yes. with a young reporter who tried to ask him some questions. Yes, we've actually got the clip, so let's have a look at it. So tell me, what does it feel like to be in Glass Onion? It was such an amazing film. I really loved it. I love a thriller. How fun is it to shoot something like that? Well, I'm barely in it. I'm in it for about three seconds. Yeah, but yeah. still, you showed up and you had fun, right? Uh, almost. OK, all yeah. right. <laughs> OK, well, thank you so much. It was nice to talk to you. Yeah. All right, back to you guys. I mean, what an, yeah. all what an absolute plank. piece of work yeah. he is. That is a and that's actually the best of it, isn't it? Because the bit that came before that, he was even it's, more modest. It's celebrity. shocking. He's yeah. beyond rude to a young Oh, no, to I'm sorry. No, no, no. That was very funny. Ah, no, that he <laughs> Listen, he, if you get uh, Kevin O'Sullivan to the Oscars and get him to do an interview, that would look exactly the same. Go pluck a guy from Blackpool. Kevin O'Sullivan's never going to be invited to the Oscars. <laughs> Well, oh, for, for that reason. But go get a guy from Blackpool who's just walked out of the pub. I mean, yeah, but he's not, though. No, but the point he's is... Not. But he's this a is guy... Very British dry... He, no, it isn't. No, 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 no. It's, it's fundamentally bad manners. That lady with the microphone... Ashley Who's Graham. not actually okay. a, a reporter. She's, okay. a, she's a model. OK, but is there to perform a job and may or may not get further work opportunities depending on how well they did. Asked a perfectly reasonable question which should have elicited... A perfectly reasonable yeah. answer. And if, he, and if he doesn't want to go on a red carpet, then what's he doing there? I know. I, I know I some people, funny. and maybe you're one of them, think that he was being funny and he was being oh, acting See, up I, like Hugh I Grant. thought he was being funny. I've met Hugh Grant and I thought he was quite nice. <laughs> Well, he would I like you. Was being, yeah. Well, of course, uh, he would you know, like you. You know the bigger issue here. I mean, here. he is not. Re he, his reputation is not one of a. Well, it certainly precedes. And, 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 and <laughs> I thought it was funny. It's funny I, I how the women here think it's funny. Here's the, here's the, here's the, funny. Thing, it's the, the thing. It's the bloody he, women he, that he, like him. But that's he, the fancy him. This is yeah, that's it. I know we don't fancy him. I certainly don't fancy him. He's not my type. Look, the thing is, he is. Just, he's scornful of, of these people that are in Hollywood no, that go to these award well, shows he doing there, and then? pretend like they've but cured it, cancer it, because they all dress in you hundred thousand pound gowns. Twitter. He's scornful of two groups of people: journalists, journalists, he hates journalists. And, and capitalists and conservatives. Yeah, yeah. and he's he another sort of he's a, he is a virtuous, wokey, wonderful, nice guy. And when the mask slips, when the camera's on, you see what he really is, which <laughs> yeah. is an embittered, angry. Nasty well, you know why he doesn't like the press. Socialist. Champagne Don't socialist. Yeah. He lives around in Kensington. Of course he does. It's very nice for him. Mm. And uh, it's not so nice for all the people that he's trying to point fun at and just be... The brutal. thing is, these people, these a lot of these Hollywood people, what they do when they go to these award shows, the reason why they bombard us with their virtue signaling crap during their speeches is because they feel like, because they're, they're all dressed in multi-million, the multi-thousand pound gowns and they're in this literally room of luxury well, they were barely and dressed this they, time. Yes, they feel a responsibility to lecture the public about issues going on in the world. However, the reality is most people in Hollywood don't have their lives together. And if they were really that incensed about it, they would have award shows in McDonald's. They wouldn't wear these 10,000 pound gowns and act like they've cured cancer. You play pretend for a living. You play Get pretend. A but he doesn't have to pretend to be a horrible git, because he is. <laughs> um, but thanks very much indeed. Coming up, uh, oh, it's me next. Uh, I'm going to be going on about the people on strike this week, because there was about half a million of them, believe it or not. Incredible. This is Plank of the Week. Let's all have a laugh, shall we? <laughs> Welcome back to Plank of the Week. We've reached the final furlong, but don't worry, uh, we haven't finished yet because, one, I have to choose who Plank of the Week is, which is entirely my purview these days. I don't uh, enter into any kind of um, educational uh, or democratic process. Um, but I've got one more uh, for you, and, Dr Renee, you'll like this one because I'm going to go, despite the fact that half a million people were actually on strike this week, we had the teachers out on strike, we had uh, the tube drivers out, we had rail workers out, we had 130,000 civil servants out... Because 
because they wanted to screw up the budget. I mean, I think these civil servants, if they never came back to work at all, the country would run a lot better, mm. you know, because they seem to, the border force weren't working either, which means they won't be helping the illegal migrants come in on the boats. Yeah, like uh, they've been managing so, that well. Yeah, but, I mean, it's better when they're not there because, you know, they don't bring the boats in. It just so, falls apart when you want a passport, though, doesn't it? Well, actually, funnily enough, they, they fixed that once they outed the woman in charge of the passport agency. They worked out <laughs> she hadn't been back to the office for two years and then suddenly <laughs> things got a lot better. But anyway, um, so I'm going for junior doctors <coughs> because these junior doctors are busy trying to convince everybody that they've got the hardest job in the world um, they've been out on picket lines. I saw one picket line this week, um, which wasn't a very nice, particularly nice day. Two blokes with one placard, you know. And it was pathetic. You know, it was like something out of Citizen Smith. And these guys <laughs> are standing there trying to elicit, you know, people's sympathy. When they went out for three days, right? Yeah. People would have died as a result Definitely. of that. People will not have been seen. They've, they will have had their, um, you know, their appointments cancelled. All sorts of things would have been going on. And they never tell the truth. They actually came out this week and said that you can make uh, the same amount of money working in Pret mm. because they said for the hourly rate, it's about the same. But what they didn't tell you is that if you work in Pret, you don't get a pension. Exactly. If you work in Pret, you don't get overtime. You don't get double uh, money if you do a weekend shift or a bank holiday shift. They don't tell you any of that. And in and two years' time, you'll be earning a lot more than And the most of them are earning minimum 50000 a year. Oh, yeah. And when because... they get to... to, to... 30, 40, they're going yeah. to be earning significant six right. figures. Right. You can work in prep for 25 years, yeah. you'll still be coming home with 16 yeah. grand at I the would, end of the I year. would have said to any of those union leaders, because it's the BMA who are to blame here, that if you really want to prove to me that you get the same money as somebody working in prep, you find me a junior doctor, you show me how much they make, and you put them next to somebody in prep, and I guarantee they couldn't do it. And every year, medicine at university is the most oversubscribed course. Three times. Yeah. People are desperate to become doctors. But the BMA it's... wants to limit the numbers. That's why you haven't got enough courses. Well, because they, they, don't have, they the haven't opened the training well. places because they haven't put the investment into yes. it to create more training spaces. But I think that's a very disingenuous argument to compare mm. how much you make to someone working at Starbucks. I mean, really, that's not even... Starbucks is not a particularly... Being a barista is not a particularly skilled job compared to having to go through five oh, years well, I'll tell you what, looking at some of these junior doctors at the picking line, I wouldn't want them anywhere near me if I took them <laughs> with me. They don't look as if they could even pour you a cup of coffee. Well, I, I, was I mean, I was attacked roundly by anonymous doctors on Twitter this yeah. week. And, you know, I queried the fact that they didn't pay for their training. Actually, the taxpayer paid for their training. Yeah. Yes, they have their uni debt, which I have had too. But... You know, they actually had the audacity to say to an older doctor who said, we used to work 110 hours a week, ah, uh, but when you were doing that, yeah. medicine oh, wasn't yeah, that you complex. Don't know. I know. Wasn't Listen, that complex. I'm not having it. Absolutely not having it. I'd love to nominate them as the winners. But I've got to be now uh, judging the winner. But I'm afraid uh, it can only be one winner, can't it? It has to be the BBC. Ah! The BBC, <laughs> so Esther Kraku, yeah. well done. Uh, the BBC Planks of the Week for all sorts of reasons. Thanks to Esther. Uh, thank you very much for Sam. Thanks to Dr. Renee. And of course, thanks to Peter Blexley. We'll see you next time.